we're going to go back to this little schema here and I'm going to recapitulate the idea that when you're looking at the world this is a pragmatic frame of reference it's also a cybernetic frame of reference and I think it's one of the easiest ways to understand a Piagetian schema or and the beginnings of a schemata so a schemata is sort of like an arrangement of schemas and schemas are like tools to deal with the world and the tool that you're you're using to deal with the world is the tool that gets you what you want when you act it out so here's some propositions with regards to how those schemas might be formulated one is is that you're somewhere that's point A and the next is you want some transformation in the world to occur otherwise you wouldn't be acting right so you have some vision of the outcome that you wish to obtain and then you have a sequence of behaviors at the most fundamental level of analysis you have a sequence of embodied behaviors that you can apply to the world and hopefully that produces the transformation that you want now you can take a page from biology and you can say well a lot of these schemas or, or brief narratives are embedded in biological systems so for example if you're hungry then that's going to set up a particular schema and if you're thirsty that's going to set up a particular schema and so on but human beings are capable of high levels of abstraction so that instead of pursuing direct biological goals we can perform operations that are in some way conceptually linked to the fulfillment of biological goals in a social environment across large spans of time which is a much more complicated question you know because I might say well why are you guys sitting here what does that have to do with biological necessity and the answer is well in some sense it's rather tenuous in that it's multiple stages removed from absolute necessity but your hypothesis is instead of foraging around in the frozen ground for nuts it might be better to adopt a career because that will solve all of your biological problems simultaneously and so again I'm going to repeat that so the animal's problem is how to fulfill a motivational state we'll say your problem is how to fulfill multiple motivational states in a social environment that's composed of many other people doing the same thing in the short term, the medium term, and the long term and you want to come up with a solution that will satisfy all those constraints simultaneously now Piaget would regard a, a solution like that as an equilibrated state an equilibrated state is a, is a solution that um, isn't producing anomalies or novelties when it's enacted in the world and so it's important to understand this because it forms part of the Piagetian uh, theory of morality now Piaget he was a kind of a strange guy he was a childhood prodigy um, he was studying animals in depth when he was a small child he published his first scientific paper when he was 10 which was on the behavior of mollusks and the next year he was offered the curatorship of a museum in Switzerland but his parents given his developmental stage had to <laughs> tell the people who wanted him to take over the curatorship that he was only 11 and that it probably wouldn't be appropriate now when Piaget was an adolescent he went through what you might describe as a messianic crisis he actually regarded messianism, messianism as a developmental stage that often characteristic, characterized late adolescence and so at that stage people are concerned with the relationship between their individual lives and the broader social community and when he was in that messianistic stage and very much concerned about morality he was also suffering from the tension between scientific and religious points of view and one of the things that he wanted to do as an adult was to reconcile values with science or broad, more broadly speaking religion with science but we'll stick to values and morality with science and I think he got farther along on that than anyone else has and the equilibrated state <clears throat> is one of his most intelligent propositions so an equilibrated state would be something like it could be two things it could be you in a happy family and it could be the happy family it depends on your level of analysis but you in a happy family are going to be equilibrated because assuming that you're as happy as the rest of the family what that means is that you found a mode of operation that simultaneously works for you and for your family and a higher order equilibrated state would be happy you in a happy family in a happy city let's say and so there are multiple levels of potential equilibration and Piaget's, one of Piaget's fundamental claims was that an equilibrated state was preferable so there's a value judgment there to a disequilibrated state 
And the reason for that was that it took less energy per unit of work to maintain an equilibrated state. So think about it this way. So there's family A and there's family B. And they're competing in a, in a local environment. And family B is very disharmonious. And so in order for the family to get anything done, or any of the individuals within the family, there has to be a tremendous amount of conflict. And so the load is whatever they have to do, plus the conflict they have to go through in order to do it. And in many cases, if the situation is disequilibrated enough, then the conflict that you have to go through to do whatever it is that you want to do actually requires more energy than the thing itself. And so Piaget's point was then, whereas in a happy family, we'll say, an equilibrated family, both the individuals and the family as a unit can move forward without wasting a lot of time in conflict. And so Piaget's idea was that, you know, in a, in a race for success, however you happen to define success, the equilibrated system is going to outperform the disequilibrated system because the disequilibrated system has to waste time and energy on enforcement. That's a lovely idea, it's, it's a profound idea, because what it does is it, set up, it sets up the preconditions for starting to understand how value judgments, so to speak, and value judgments are outcroppings of theories of action, because a theory of action has to do with what you should do, and that's a value judgment. Piaget would say that the, the patterns of action and the value judgments that lead towards a more thoroughly equilibrated state are better. Now, you can take that a bit further and you can say that, and this is sort of akin to Piaget's ideas that children go through stages of development that are somewhat identifiable across cultures, although there's a fair bit of debate about that. It's, it's a quasi-Piagetian notion that there only might be a finite number of equilibrated solutions to a set of given problems. So you can imagine, well, <clears throat> you pop up on the horizon, you're born, and you're a particular kind of entity. Now, there are some things that you can do as an entity to continue your, your existence as an entity, and there's other things that you can't do, so you're bounded by a set of limitations and possibilities. One of the limitations seems to be is that your family has to be sufficiently well integrated so that you get a certain amount of attention. So, for example, if babies don't get a certain amount of physical attention in the first year of their life, so nobody literally touches them and plays with them, then they'll often die because their gastrointestinal systems will shut down. And even if they don't die, they're so impaired afterwards as a consequence of that lack of initial stimulation that they never recover. And so you can see right off the bat that one of the preconditions for even for existence as a human being is that you have to be born into a familial environment that, that has certain structures in place. Now, some of them are obvious, like, well, you should be fed, and you have to be fed what you need to be fed, and you have to be protected and sheltered. And, and you know, you have to be exposed to a certain amount of information flow, and so on. So your physical, obvious physical needs have to be taken care of, but then there are less obvious things that you need from your local environment, like physical attention, literally touch, and play, and social interaction, and language, because if any of those are lacking in the initial developmental stages, depends on the stage, then you're going to be so crippled that you won't be able to, you won't be able to survive and thrive in the world. So then you can think that, you know, imagine that there's a set of constraints that define the system within which you can thrive as an individual. Then you might say, well, there's a set of constraints within which a family can survive as a family without blowing apart. And then, if you put multiple families together in some sort of community, there's a set of constraints that have to be met for those families to live together in relative harmony, and so on, all the way up the levels of complexity. And a properly equilibrated state, as I said, would be one where you're thriving in a thriving family, in a thriving community, and so forth, all the way up the, all the, way up the chain of complexity. So, it's a very, very, very smart idea. And you can also imagine that one of the things that that means is that representations of moral systems might have some similarities across cultures. Now, we know this is true already, because there are a number of human universals. But if you take individuals and you put them in geographical area A, and you take different individuals and you put them in geographical area B, 
because of the nature of the constraints and the fact that there's some relatively limited subset of solutions that will satisfy everyone at each of those levels of analysis you're going to expect relatively similar moral systems to develop in different cultures and so it's also a powerful argument against moral relativism now you know relativism is a tricky thing because you know you can ask yourself well are people the same or are they different and the answer to that is well it depends on what you mean when you ask the question you know and I, I'm not being uh, sarcastic about that that question is not answerable without some additional information about what you're up to because it's like saying well are human languages the same or different and the answer is well they're the same and different there are levels of analysis at which they're the same and there are levels of analysis at which they're different and whether you consider the levels of analysis with the similarities more important than the levels of analysis with the differences is going to depend on what you want as a consequence of asking the question so but we do know that there are broad and identifiable similarities across people that don't seem to be merely biological, they're also biological and cultural and you know you can see examples of that pretty quickly by the fact that you know I think there are going to be more smartphones in the world next year than there are people and so it's pretty obvious that there's a universal market for smartphones and that says something about you know that says something about the makeup of people themselves regardless of culture because people find tools that facilitate social communication desirable and they find tools that facilitate information gathering desirable and they don't have to be taught to desire that they are just like that 